David, I'm delighted to be having this conversation with you. It's about your research, and you roped me into it. <laughs> we were sitting together in my office, and you were describing what you were up to, and we started comparing notes and telling stories to each other, and we burst out laughing, and we said, we should do something together. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you are most welcome to listen in on our conversation, and then later on to, to become involved as well, as David will invite you to reflect on what we've said. To reflect on how language and the language we use both reflects and shapes who we are. I'm here in my capacity as a faculty member in biblical studies, and you'll see shortly how that plays into our conversation. David is here as a specialist in communication theory and media studies. And as you can see from the title of this presentation, we are here to share with you David's preliminary findings from his research into when and why people say, oh my God. Well, thanks, Gordon. I feel really privileged to be sharing the evening with you as well. And I've been, you know, one of, one of the reasons why I'm so delighted to be here with you is because I've been waiting for quite some time to ask a biblical scholar, when was the last time you said, oh my God? And I, I have a sense that I'm going to have that opportunity tonight because you're right here. I have, I have you with me. So let's jump in. Uh, David, I, I, I have to begin by making a confession. That would be appropriate for a biblical scholar, I would imagine. <laughs> when I was very young, my mother taught me never to say a bad word. Shut up was forbidden, and gee or gosh were out of the question. I've only said damn once. <laughs> Uh, twice. <laughs> and I said it in a sermon at Parliament Community Church in Regina. And when I was back there this past June doing a, we a weekend workshop, I actually asked them if they remembered me saying that. And nobody remembered. So, <laughs> as I was growing up, anything crude or referring to God in sort of casual speech was out of the question. Exclamatory speech using God language was not Absolutely allowed. Out. Absolutely yeah. out. I remember once, however, when I was a teenager working with my dad's company in the summer, he had a carpet and drapery store, and on, in a summer job, I was installing draperies in a large apartment complex in Vancouver. And I was working alone, installing the drapery tracks. And as a teenager, I thought, now what would happen if I started using some of these words? <laughs> so I, I actually, this is my confession. <laughs> I've never said this in public anywhere before. Well, I'm so delighted I can be here with you to share this moment. I tried using some of these words. I even used the F word out loud as I was working to see what would happen. <laughs> I'd say a word, I'd never said it before. What did it sound like? You know, would there be a lightning bolt from heaven? I quickly realized that all of these words actually by themselves out of context sounded stupid. <laughs> Right? But nevertheless, that began my short experimentation with swear words. But my mother always lingered, like she was right here. And I soon, I stopped that altogether. To this day, I don't ever say any expletives because of my mother. Except, you know, yesterday, <laughs> Yesterday I was thinking about... This is more it. than one confession. This is a whole series of confessions. No, I was revising what I had prepared. And you know what came to me? I actually had, had blocked this out entirely. I actually say holy smoke a lot. <laughs> and I do it completely unconsciously. Hmm. 
But there's no way I would ever say, oh my God, as so many people these days do. After all, it's in the Ten Commandments. It says, thou shalt not say, oh my God. Yeah, right, of course. <laughs> Wait a minute, was that the third one or the, the fourth it's a, one? It's the third, third one. one. Well, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Over the past two or three weeks, David and I have been chatting a lot. We've been laughing a lot. We've been having fun. But what really, what do I do when somebody says, oh my God, let's say, okay, I don't say it, but if somebody does, or let's say if you're tempted, or if you're tempted mm -hmm. to say, oh my God, what do I say? Do I say, holy smoke, you're breaking. <laughs> <laughs> you're breaking the third commandment. Gets complicated. <laughs> By the way, the third commandment reads, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's the King James Version or the NRSV, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. So, hence my, my need to confess. That sounds fairly harsh though, doesn't it? Still, I bet most people who say, oh my God, don't really mean to use God's name, uh, don't mean to misuse it. They're probably more or less right the point of that commandment is more like, like this. Don't manipulate God's name in such a way, or don't manipulate God in such a way that you use God or religious whatever to get what you think you want. You know, to, to use God or religion to, to, to support your own agenda. Um, it, it's sort of like saying, don't do that because God's power and presence can't be simply at our disposal, can't be manipulated. Most people, when they say, oh my God, are not thinking about manipulating God to get what they want. That's so what do you think you should do? Well, I should probably just say, oh my goodness. Okay. But, okay, that's that safe. That would be safer. That's safer, but... What I really want to do is banish my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and just say, oh my God. If I could say, oh my God, I would fit in. You know, I would be culturally relevant. Connected. Rel connected, yeah. relevant. I hate being excluded. And so if I could say it, I'd fit in. And I wouldn't have to say stupid things like, I mean, can you, th can you imagine, what other word would you use? Like, I'm a biblical scholar, or let's say I like books. I would say, oh, my book! <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> There's no other word, is there? It doesn't work somehow. It doesn't work, like, oh, my God. It works, you can say it, it, it fits. It's, no wonder people say it. It's so easy to say. Well, uh, sounds to me, Gordon, like you have a few issues. Um, and I'm not sure we'll get to all of them tonight, but I'm going to try to get to a few of them. Not necessarily because I'm going to answer all your questions, but you do a fantastic job of highlighting the quandary that I think we find ourselves in. And uh, we're going to invite you into the conversation to give you a few ways to think about this and then see where, where you land. So. Before I get to, I will get to your question, the specific, oh my God or not, and I, of course I wouldn't suggest you, the idea of banishing your mother may not on any grounds be a good place to start, but we'll, uh, we'll get to that response in a moment. I need to take you back just a bit, a few steps back to tell you why I'm curious about oh my God, because there's a larger context here, and it is this. Um, I don't know if you realize, Gordon, but you're actually in the middle of a video shoot right now. Like, like that's why Grant is there with the camera, and there's another one in the back. And so I'd like you just, if, if you could just fill out this uh, consent form for me, because uh, <laughs> that gives me permission to edit, remix, broadcast you anywhere, wherever. And could you sign for these folks as well, because it would take too long to get them to fill it out. Thanks. Uh, don't worry about the fine print. I think it's called Lorem Epsom or something like that. Um, but we are actually in the middle of a documentary film shoot. We are actually taping this live right now. And part of my interest in making a short film or documentary still, 
remains to be seen what the format will be and why this topic is because of this. My larger research interest that grows out of these 12 years of uh, co-hosting and producing talk radio here in Winnipeg before I came to CMU is that there's this challenge before me and it continues for people like me and other producers and it is this. As a person keenly desiring to share good news, and N.T. Wright puts it this way, the powerful announcement that God is God, that Jesus is Lord, that the powers of evil have been defeated, and that God's new world has begun. As someone desiring to share that in some way, what does good broadcasting look like? How do I bring together theological conviction coupled with communication theory in a way to create media that meets market share demands and is actually experienced as good news. So the bigger research project for me then is about developing a framework of how we design content. Two things that I draw out of that framework that have compelled me into the Oh My God project. One of them comes out of theology and the other out of communication theory. Genesis chapter 2, we find this remarkable moment, this call to what Quentin Schultz calls symbolic stewardship. And in Genesis 2, and we, this is the account before Eve is in the picture, so hence the language, it says, out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal, the, uh, every animal of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever... The man called every living creature, that was its name. Just think about that. I believe this may just be the most audacious act of God to imbue his creation with this capacity for symbolic action on such a fundamental level that humans everywhere since are invited to co-create culture with God through naming. We have a somewhat absurd privilege to name children. And that continues as an expression of that original invitation. So I have this exercise, this activity with my class every, every year. I ask them to share stories of how they were named and, with each other. So you, just last week, we had everything from this long generational lineage uh, name uh, and an amazing act of God that is captured in the name, and as well, the, uh, a mother's favorite noodle. Craft dinner, called her daughter Katie after the craft dinner that she enjoys. <laughs> I mean, just look at that process and tell me for a moment that God doesn't have an immense sense of humor when he gives us the capacity to mess with symbols, arrange them, and then name reality. And in the process, we make more of the world than what was there just a few moments before. And God asks us, how will you name the world in a life-giving way? Quentin Schultz puts it this way, like symbolic gardeners, we have to figure out which symbols to plant, where to plant them in space and time, and how to nurture them so they will bear the fruit of shalom. Symbols can point people to God or lead them to despair. So, theology, good theology, plus good communication theory equals good broadcasting. So, good theology snippet number one. When you go and produce media, it's a gift you've been given it's not for your own purposes. Communication theory, second reference point for me. Out of James Carey, a wonderful uh, communication theorist who just passed away not too long ago from the University of Illinois. He describes communication, uh, human communication in two ways, with two words. He calls one model transmission and the other ritual. He suggests that the way we think about the act of communicating makes a difference. Why? Because first we produce the world, we describe it through our symbols, and then we inhabit it. We live in that description. So if I describe communication as transmission, he says, the archetypal case in that scenario views communication as the extension of messages across geography for the purpose of control. From point A to point B, to make something happen, to control something. Whereas the ritual view of communication is to draw in a kind of sacred ceremony people together in fellowship and community. Now you may say, well, like, okay, 
why does it matter how I think about communication if I'm going to go produce something? Here's why it matters. Those two perspectives will take me down different roads with different outcomes. If I imagine that my job as a producer is to get a message from point A to point B in order to control the person on the other end, that will have me create that thing in a particular way. If, on the other hand, I imagine my role to be one of drawing people together in fellowship to create a meaningful cultural world where they can discover who they are, I will produce something else. So the question is, then, why produce a short film about when was the last time you said, oh my God? Well, for me, this production project is an expression of what gets created when I cultivate a theology of symbolic stewardship informed by ritual communi- a, a ritual view of communication. So I'm joining a conversation that's already happening and inviting the presence of God in the middle of that. Dr. William Four wrote a book called Television and Religion. He says this, media is probably not very good at giving us a lot of serious answers to religious questions because you don't have two-way communication. But you can use media to help, pe- to help people ask, who am I? Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? Am I of any intrinsic worth, and if so, why? And this, in turn, he says, can lead people to communities of faith, to faith itself. So the short film that's still in its infancy is my attempt at experimenting with content design and Grant Heppner from Family Life Network. We signed a memorandum of understanding, which is bringing a lot of all the technical production you'll see in a moment into the project. It's a creative funding formula between two organizations. I'm the content person, grants the tech. And that combination now brings us to this larger research project of developing a framework of trying to understand what makes for good broadcasting. Now, enough about the background. That's the backstory. Here are some of the findings that may find their way into this short film. The first time I became curious about Oh My God was quite a few years ago, and this video will tell you the story of the very first time I ever asked somebody, when was the last time you said, Oh My God? I'm David Bolser, Assistant Professor of Communications and Media here at Canadian Mennonite University. This film project is my research, and your use of Oh My God is the topic. The first time I ever asked somebody, when was the last time you said, oh my God, I was sitting at the University of Manitoba in Wise Guys, planning an event with some friends. And I turned to a group of students behind me, and I asked one of the guys, I said, "Uh, when was the last time you said, oh my God? He said, oh, I just said it this morning when I was standing in front of the mirror. The girl next to him almost fell off her chair. And I said, well, here's the critical question. When you're standing in front of the mirror, you say, oh my God, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? He says, no, no. When I'm in front of the mirror and I say, oh my God, that is a good thing. I'm curious about this oh my God phenomenon. Some people suggest that Canada is becoming less and less religious almost by the minute. And yet, the use of this phrase in the name of God seems to be only on the increase. Why would a preteen use this phrase to express themselves rather than the name of any other deity? When you go cliff diving and you start jumping off that rock and you say, oh my God, as you jump in, I'm on a documentary film adventure to ask some questions and to test my hunches. I just got one question for you. When was the last time you said, oh my God? My curiosity about the presence of this phrase also led me to sociolinguistics and Dr. Sally Tagliamati. Sociolinguistics, in my simple understanding, is the study of how language variation happens through social interaction. I noticed this incredible variation in the usage of the phrase, and I wanted to understand how is that possible. First time I met Dr. Tagliamati was reading her research in an article that she'd co-authored entitled, So Weird, So Cool, So Innovative, the use of intensifiers in the television series Friends. She was interested in the linguistic form in youth 
And the words she was interested in were things like, like, or just, or so. I was interested in the words that surprisingly followed right after those words. That's how I discovered her. Because in her corpus, in her research of, of various uh, speaking uh, records, she was looking at the word like, and in the text was the word like, oh my God, that was amazing. That's how I discovered her research. And what I found we had in common was that those two, her words and my phrase, were functioning in the same way in the English language. Well, being a producer and uh, wanting to grab the story, I picked up the phone one day and I called her at the University of Toronto and I said, I would love to interview you. And Grant was coming back from Moscow into Toronto late January and I flew out there. We spent two days in Toronto to test this idea and the first place we stopped was the linguistics department at the University of Toronto and had a conversation with Dr. Sally Tagliamati. In 90% of the cases of language change, women lead. And the women who are doing the leading are typically adolescents. I moved back uh, to Canada from England in 2001, and of course, um, the children were quite a bit older. Uh, and, but here I was in the middle of urban Toronto. Uh, and can you imagine what I was hearing at my kitchen table? <laughs> <laughs> well, there were a lot of intensifiers, I tell you, and a lot of other fascinating features of language. So I decided I'd spent so much of my career talking to old men on mountaintops, as I said, <laughs> talked about it, and, you know, uh, elderly people in small remote villages. That I thought, I'm missing this bubbling, percolating, living language that's coming out of my own children, and all I really have to do is sit here and not say anything and listen to what they say. And there I will find the features of language that are now innovating, are moving, that are bubbling into effervescent change. What intensifiers do is they emphasize, they add a bit of effervescence. That's my word of the day, I guess. Effervescence <laughs> to the language. So your grandmother might say to you, ah, oh, it's a very cold day today. And you and I might say, it's, it's really cold out today. But what my kids were saying was, it's so cold out today. It's so <laughs> crazy. It's so not fair, mom. This kind of thing. And I thought, where's all that coming from? And so I started looking at these emphatic words, these words that the, the kids were using to emphasize things. And I discovered that intensifiers are a really great way to tap into language change because you can almost see the generations in the way people use intensifiers. In fact, if you don't see somebody and you just listen to how they use intensifiers, you can probably predict how old they are. So the intensifier doesn't stay the same Intensifi over time? Exactly. Intensifiers have to change all the time so that they remain intense because just by their very nature. Mm. You can't have an intensifier that sticks around too long because it's not very intense anymore. You have to keep making them up. You have to keep making new ones. It's more than just the words we use. There's something else going on. It's the way we use the words and it's how those ways of speaking are really part of our, our inner being and our identity. And so in, in, in whatever way we want to express our identity, it will come out in the way we, we, we speak whether we want it to or not. Just as an aside, I don't know if you heard the comment about intensifiers and the fact that they come and go, which tells me that we better get this film produced before people forget that we ever used this phrase. Oh my God, right? Fascinating in her research is the notion that intensifiers are directly linked to expressions of personal emotion. They don't remain static and their use and meaning are constantly shifting. It was equally amazing to me that she unequivocally stated that 40 years of linguistics research demonstrates that it's actually preteen and early teen females where language innovation happens when it comes to creating intensifiers. So if you're kind of going, oh, my daughter says it all the time, my granddaughter, they're just always saying, oh my God. She, I asked Sally kind of just in jest, and she said, no, that's exactly what the research is telling us. So there's something about the Valley Girls that is actually generating our language 
in, uh, in our experience. So it's clear that, oh my God, has become this commonplace intensifier used to express emotion. And I'm just going to collapse my next comments here because I want to get to Gordon. The second element that I looked at and that I'm working on is why do people find themselves so put off by this phrase? Intensifiers are out there. People use them. They don't think about them. But other people think about it a lot. Where is that coming from? And what's going on there? Well, the work of Dr. Timothy J. and all you have to do is notice that there's three circles up there. You don't have to try to figure out the words. I just want to get a sense of the constellation. He wrote a book called Why We Curse, a Neuropsychosocial Theory of Speech. And in 2005, listen to the title of his article. This tells you about the other element that's at play here. The article is called American Women, Their Cursing Habits and Religiosity. In his theory, he suggests that there's a neurological dimension to swearing, there's a social dimension, and there's a psychological. And in his theory, religiosity is a psychological characteristic. And his research suggests that the religiosity, the affiliation, both institutional and subjective, of our experience creates a sense of identity that profoundly shapes our understanding of language. Here's the fascinating thing about people in religious communities. We use this mundane, these little squiggles to make common day things happen, and we also suggest that those very same squiggles connect me to the divine. And that changes everything. So a, a notion of the sacredness of language emerges within the religious community, I take that on and that changes everything. So we walk into an oh my God world where on the one hand we have these intensifiers, on the other hand we have people shaped by this religious dynamic that has a completely different understanding of the notion of God and those create constant tension. Now, Gordon, we've talked about this before. You have suggested to me that there's a biblical perspective that this can respond to. So throw us into Scripture. Well, I have to begin with something just a little bit technical. I hope you don't mind. Go, not as technical. Go ahead. Not as technical as what you've talked about <laughs> in the last few minutes. I just said people express themselves intensely and they're religious. That's okay. basically all I okay. said. So, uh, let me begin that, uh, by saying that in, in terms of the biblical language for oh my God, oh my God, understood grammatically, is evocative. Okay. Okay, it's up there. For example, in 2 Samuel 14, there's a story of a woman, she's called the wise woman of Tekoa, who at the instigation of Joab is pretending to be in mourning. She comes to the king and says, help, O king. <laughs> in that statement, O king is evocative. But we would never say that today. We, as the new uh, translation, the Common English Bible puts it, would simply say, would simply say, help, king. Or, king, help me. The woman is simply making a formal appeal to the king, and so it seems is saying in the NRSV or the King James, O oh, king, to get his attention. Now, vocatives have fallen on hard times these days in that we don't use them very well. In Psalm 103, verse 1, we read, Praise the Lord, O my soul. It sounds archaic, doesn't it? Do any of you ever say, O my soul? <laughs> we don't use O in everyday English. We don't say, O police officer, <laughs> please don't give me a ticket. <laughs> 
In fact, most recent translations of the Bible, like the Common English Bible, don't even use O in situations where the vocative with O might be used. The Common English Bible just says God or my God. So now here's another way of putting it. The word vocative comes from the Latin vocare, which means to call. So when we use a vocative, we're calling out to someone. For example, when I yell upstairs and say, Laurie, could you? No, that's not yelling, is it? No. <laughs> when I yell upstairs and say, Laurie, could you please come and help me fold the laundry? Which I do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using a... Calling or the laundry? Which one all the Both. time? Both. Oh, okay. I'm using a vocative. <laughs> I, if I were living... A hundred years ago, I would say, oh, Lori. Anyway, <laughs> I'm sure you get the picture. Now, you might be thinking, you might be thinking, all right, oh, my God is about calling out to God. I knew that already. <laughs> and that's why it's a bad thing to do, because you're only pretending. You don't really mean it, right? Now, wait a minute. Here's just a bit of data from the Psalms, the book in the Bible that uses, oh, my God, most frequently. So, I'm going to spare you the details, just some bare bones. And I'm going to work with the English instead not of... Not that. Not that. No. Okay. That's Oh My God in Hebrew. Okay. We should have used that as our logo. You should. But, yeah. <laughs> didn't, didn't realize until tonight that okay, it was so, available. Oh My God appears just like that. Oh My God in the NIV, 11 times in the Psalms. 13 times in the new RSV. And, O oh Lord, or, O oh Lord my God, appears like, like, <laughs> <laughs> appears about 60 to 80 times, I forgot. But for now, let's just consider, O oh my God, as it appears in English, just because we're having this conversation. Here are a few examples. And I'm going to try to pronounce them as I think they might ought to be. That's from Nashville. Might ought to be pronounced. <laughs> All right? Actually, I can't because I'm sort of laughing, and so I'm going <laughs> to just read them. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my gro groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, but find no rest. Or from Psalm 25. Oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not forsake me, O oh Lord. Oh my God, do not be far from me. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and the cruel. Oh God, do not be far from me. Oh my God, make haste to help me. Oh my God, I say, do not take me away at the midpoint of my life, you whose years endure throughout all generations. All of these assume a profound intimacy with God. But ironically, every one of them, and I'm only giving you, what, five out of what, 50 or 60, Every one of them suggests that from the vantage point of the psalmist and the psalmist's experience, there is something desperately wrong. Something desperately wrong. All of these examples assume what Psalm 140, verse 6, asserts plainly. I say to the Lord, you are my God. Give ear, O Lord, to the voice of my supplications. Because of the intimacy of the relationship, the psalmist expects God to respond. Yet all of the examples reflect a kind of rhetorical irony. Although the psalmists call on God, they are actually offering a protest. God, you see, is not behaving as my God. Therefore, if you are my God, 
than saying, oh my God, should be a perfectly natural and appropriate thing to say in the face of desperation or loss of hope or panic or fear. Something has gone awry and God, dare I say this, God is not pulling God's weight. You see this slightly differently in this plaintive cry. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. In other words, all of these expressions of oh my God that I had up on the screen earlier are found in lament psalms in which the psalmist's God is absent, far away, and disinterested. The psalmists express their pain, they question, they even argue with God, and they struggle with the disconnect between God's promises and their experience. So then, what does that suggest about saying, oh my God, today? First of all, a slight diversion. I'd like to suggest that people have to decide whether they are saying O oh, or O. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. It makes sense because it's on the screen. This is important. It's harder to hear in your language, easier to read on That's the screen. That's why I put it on the yeah. screen. <laughs> this is important. When spoken, you can't tell the difference. Of course, it gets more complicated if in texting, one simply uses the abbreviation OMG, right? Here's what I found out about that. The first time that OMG was used in written form was in a letter by Lord John Fisher to Sir Winston Churchill in 1917. <laughs> Not by some 12-year-old uh, girl. <laughs> <laughs> you see, if only he had a cell phone, right? He would have been able to... You see, he had learned through the grapevine that he was about to be knighted. And so he wrote to Winston Churchill, and this is what he wrote, O period, M period, uh, M period, G period, O exclamation mark, my God, exclamation mark. Exactly as you see it on the screen. As an article in The Spectator from two years ago puts it, quote, the Edwardians would be expected to exclaim O, O H, on burning a finger, but O oh dear, O, when commiserating. Today, O is used before vocatives and OH for exclamations. So put that into your research. I, I am right now. We're taping it. Here, here's another... So what are the implications? No, just one more example. One of the original translators of the New International Version of the Bible said this in an interview. Do you have it on the screen? I do now. He said this, the O has been lost as a vocative O and it's been turned into what we call a pathetic O. <laughs> it's the emotional O and there's nothing in the original language to indicate that. Because it's out in everyday speech, it no longer functions as the vocative, it functions as a pathetic O. There you go. <laughs> think about it. You, if you have to make a choice, every time you think about saying, oh my God, between O and O, it's going to get complicated, right? <laughs> Let me be clear. Just because, oh my God, is abused in our culture or overused, doesn't mean we should refrain from the vocative, oh my God. The O without the H. The, no H. Yeah. We, Let me say we should be saying, oh my God. The bottom one. Yes. That's the vocative. That's the vocative. That's the intimate one. The top one is the pathetic O. Oh. The pathetic, okay. My point is this. The psalmists say, oh my God, or my God, many times, and they do so precisely because they believe, from the perspective of their experience, that God must attend to their cries of desperation. Because if they don't say, oh my God, they deny the intimacy that anticipates, that hopes, and that longs for the redeeming and healing presence of God in the world. That's my argument for saying, oh, the bottom one, oh my God. 
even though I've never said that in my whole life, <laughs> you have pushed me to say, maybe I should start saying it. Because the psalmist says it. I have to admit, I have never connected before we started this three weeks ago, because the psalmist said, oh my God, that I should say it also. Hmm. I read the Psalms. Of course I read the Psalms. I've taught <laughs> the Psalms many times, but I never drew the conclusion that we should all be going about saying, oh my God. <laughs> okay, so we're going to hold that thought. We're going to now go to you. We've laid out intensifier. We've laid out the religious social identity piece. We've laid out what the psalmist brings to the conversation. When I talked to Dr. Sally Taglamani, I said, if you were investigating this phrase, what would you do? And she said, I would look for patterns, and then I would ask people why they say that. Why do you use it? So I'm going to play you a montage of street interviews we did in Toronto that same weekend, and I want you to look for patterns. Is there a vocative in, in these clips? Is there an intensifier? Is there a nuance? And then we're going to take the mic and allow you to interact and ask us questions. But we'll start with trying to discover patterns. Enjoy uh, Dundas Square in Toronto. When was the last time you said, oh my god? <laughs> like 10 seconds ago. <laughs> 10 seconds ago. <laughs> Have you said it? Yeah, I think so. Like, I don't know, 40 seconds ago, I think I'm not sure. When was the last time you said, oh my god? Probably about three seconds ago. We just heard that, like, yeah. about a minute ago. My last oh my god moment? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Maybe since I got married, then there is no more oh my god, I guess. I don't know. But when you got married, that? Uh, 2005. So maybe that was my last oh my god moment, I and, guess. <laughs> and why was that an oh my god moment? Well, because uh, the wedding uh, cake which I ordered definitely was uh, <laughs> not a good one so I was kind of uh, not afraid but some kind of, my wife wouldn't like it blah 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 and then my brother changed it and when I saw it I knew she would like it and I said oh my god that was like made my day somehow I don't know if I but that was I guess the the last time that I got relieved then I said oh my god I said huh. yeah so wow. I, I haven't been surprised in a long time but that is an amazing story. I love it. Yeah, really? No. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like she, I, she loved dolphins. I thought she loved doves. I knew she loved dolphins, but I put two doves on the cake. <laughs> I ordered doves, and then she said no. Uh, well, oh, so, man. yeah. That, that's it. Well, here's the thing. I'm hoping you have another Oh My God moment really soon. Yeah, I hope so. A good yeah. one like a that. A good one, that's yeah, yeah. That's a good one. All right? Oh My God moments are good ones, I guess. Yeah? Because you... If something is terrible, you wouldn't say, oh, my God. Oh, yeah, you might say it, but yeah. I don't know. Yeah? Well, we're finding out. That's what this is about. We're just asking people what, to tell us their stories. Oh, okay. So, so this, yeah. that was my story. Awesome. Thanks. Have a great evening, man. I say, oh, my God, quite a bit. It's did usually you? when I get frustrated with people. I'll be like, oh, my God, like, did you just do that? <laughs> like... Not one of those like, oh my god, that's so like exciting. But like, it could go either way or Um, it could go either way. But for way. you it's mostly frustration. Yeah. When was your last oh my god moment? <laughs> well. Well. Maybe when I ask her if she wants to be my girlfriend in the Madison Square Garden in New York. Yes, last Saturday. Yes. Whoa, <laughs> this is very is cool. Enough? Last night went to the Marlies game and then watched the Leafs game and uh, woke up this morning and I thought, oh my God, this is terrible. It was 2-1 when we started watching. Unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable, but it's, it's, it's happening. So what are we going to do? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so is that kind of sports related? Is that where That's, it shows up for you most of the time? Absolutely, yeah. I, was, I would say it comes out in the sports for me, for sure. We're asking people, when was their last oh my god moment? I think actually the other night, it was Friday night, when the snow was coming down and there were large flakes. Where were you? Were you driving? Were you? No, no, no. just up at Young and Eglinton. Oh, and all okay. of a sudden they were small flakes, and all of a sudden they were these, this beautiful, yeah. just yeah. very large flakes. Yeah, just sort of the, sort of the 
unexpected beauty. I just find it interesting that people use it so often and it makes me wonder because I'm always like curious about the roots of language and I'm always talking to my students when they swear for example we'll stop and we'll literally you know deconstruct the swear and we'll talk about where it comes from just to kind of get them thinking about you know what they're actually saying so it makes me wonder you know where did that come from and it my gut reaction is that it probably does have spiritual roots you know like it probably was initially just like a short arrow prayer that people used as opposed to you know like a slang or you know something that's disrespectful and what I find interesting now is that even people who you know label themselves as atheist or they don't identify with any you know particular spirituality they still use the phrase so it's like well you know oh my carpet like what am I you know like I don't know <laughs> what are you referring to exactly if there's you know if he's not there then who are you talking to yeah. right yeah. when I hear the term oh my god somebody you know who I, I may assume is not religious and I hear them say oh my god so it makes me smile in the sense that it's, it's like a subtle it's a like subliminal thing you know that person probably is raised in a religious tradition and that's why he uh, or she is sort of saying that you know like they may not they may not be religious well, well a message came up on the phone uh -huh. and it was my son and it was a message that he had a girlfriend <laughs> so it was one of those <gasps> oh my god <laughs> so did yeah. you text that back oh yes him? yes i did i said oh my god <laughs> It's a versatile it works word. Both ways. Yeah, it does. <laughs> what does it mean to you? Uh, obviously, it's 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 religious. You you're saying the God's name. You're calling God. Yeah. Just to get you know out of it. It's religious. So you're hoping God would uh, change the weather when? <laughs> like, obviously, like, how you know, does this and, work? Uh, <laughs> you you see, either it's, it's happening good to you or bad. You obviously you, you blame to God. Okay. Or you, you praise the God, okay, this is good happened to me, oh my God, I'm very happy today. <laughs> uh, something bad, bad is happening to you, okay, oh my God, what did, what did you do with me? Yeah. This is what happens. And as much as it's probably a, a blasphemous thing to say, I don't think, it's, I don't think a lot of people think, think of it as religious, it's just that go-to phrase. I think that we say because we think we're cool or something. Most of the time, if I use that expression, it's because I'm in shock about something. We're, we're collecting stories of people's oh my god moments. Well, it's not so nice, my oh my god moments. I'd love to hear it. There are some children that are sleeping on the streets. That was my oh my god moments. Just now. Just now. And when you saw them, did you actually say that phrase or? No, I thought it, yeah. You thought it? Yeah. It's children. And why was that an oh my god moment for you? Because you don't see it in Holland. Really? No. So, I think it's terrible that the children have to lie on the street in the cold. So. What brings you to Toronto? I'm a flight attendant. Oh, wow. So, we're leaving this afternoon. Wow. Yeah. And you're going, are you flying back to Amsterdam? To Amsterdam. Okay. So, is that phrase something that you hear in Amsterdam as well, like in Holland? Yeah, because you get used to it by the, because we watch uh, television. Uh -huh. So whenever you see the home makeover, oh my god! <laughs> so <laughs> we're used to it, and our children use it. They do. Yeah. Oh my god! Every time. <laughs> so. It's but for you, it's something much more profound, though. It sounds like. Yeah. Well, it's a powerful phrase, even if you're not uh, religious. Uh huh. So you use it when it's something really is. Yeah. Amazing. So you come into Toronto for a couple. A day, maybe? <laughs> yeah, 24 hours. <laughs> and this is what you leave with? Yeah. That's pretty profound. Okay, our uh, time is advancing. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, we have microphones. Uh, if you want to respond to one of these questions, do you see a pattern? Do you see an intensifier? But I want to kind of just take you to one key question that I, I am curious about. And that is, is what Gordon has laid out for us in the Psalms how does that help you make sense of your own thoughts and feelings? Because I think that's part of the rub. What do we make of this phrase that seems to have been uh, moved into the culture as an intensifier, and now it came out of the Psalms, it's, it's there, it's available to us. How do we make sense of it? What do you see in the patterns? Do you like the idea of reclaiming the vocative, in a sense? Could we start to say it again out of a religious identity? Let's go to you. Uh, Rudy has a microphone here. There's uh, Maureen up at the top. 
We only have a couple minutes, so jump right in. And uh, we put a lot on the table here. Uh, speak with us. Or ask a question. Um, right at the t upstairs desk. Uh, Go ahead. Bob, we question or observation. Uh, November 22nd, 1963 was the year that, uh, or the day that Jack, that uh, JFK was assassinated. And I recall that Jacqueline Kennedy sat there with his bloody head in her hands and said, oh my God. And you compare that with a teenager chewing gum and saying, oh, you, oh my God, do you see the color of the nail polish that they're wearing today? That's a tremendous chasm. And I think the way Jackie said it was vocative. And I think the other way that is so often used is, is, is uh, the word garbage comes to mind. Like it's, it's just so cheapened. And to, to me, that's kind of like a, uh, a religious down spiral that, that this language has, has gone through. And so to reclaim the psalm way of saying it might actually be good for us. That's my comment. My, uh, my comment just is that it seems that from the videos, things are going positive. It's either very positive, very negative. And it just reminded me of a workshop I was at two years ago in, uh, where there was a priest slash psychologist who said that there's only two, the important thing in life is to have perspective. And perspective can only be gotten in two ways. One is when your whole world falls apart and you suddenly realize what's important. Or the other way is through actually practicing gratitude and realizing that all important things you have is actually a gift. So when somebody sees the New York Tower as a plane going in there and says, oh my God, you know, because a terrible thing has happened. There's a moment of perspective there where suddenly you know what's important. And maybe on the positive side, the same thing, but I don't know how this relates. Those are both very interesting and helpful yeah. comments about the uh, that do connect very much to the Psalms and the sense of tragedy and, and loss and pain. Very helpful. When I met that woman, that flight attendant, I mean, imagine coming in Toronto for 24 hours and she's, me prompting that question, she's in this moment of, 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 of despair around these children. When I talked to her, I heard the Psalms. I didn't hear a flippant, oh my God. That's striking to me. Is there something more going on when we use that phrase, regardless of where our starting point is? That's what I'm curious about, because it's not just, it's, it's not all this level playing field, it seems to me. Another question, comment. I see many of you will remember from television or covering the the, the wreck in, in Lake Megantic. Um, and there was one part that the CBC used several times. And it was a scene of a, of a, of a man, maybe 40, 50, 50 years old, who had just come upon the scene after the explosions. And he used, mon dieu, mon dieu. And then he, and it was about three or four times. And I, I, I was thinking about that. I'd forgotten about your project, but it, it fits. I think, it, I think he had no other words. And, and he was in shock. This was his community that was going up in flames. It was something inexplicable. And the only words he was left with is actually a prayer. I, I think I might keep my mother. There's one more comment. I want to come back to Gordon's original question because we still have his mother to deal with tonight. What are you going to do, Gordon? Uh, maybe you've answered your own question. You've so eloquently laid it out. I'm going to invite you to respond to your own question and then we'll wrap it up. Are you going to add, oh my God, into your vocabulary in some way or not? And do you have to banish your mother to do that? Well, I, I think the examples we heard are fully appropriate. I'm, I'm, conf I'm confirming from this conversation that my mother was right and that I will never say things like, oh my God, this YouTube video is hilarious, <laughs> or oh my God, my roof is leaking again. But I will say this, 
Oh my God, the bombing at the church in Peshawar, Pakistan last Sunday was a horrible tragedy. Or I wouldn't worry one bit if somebody said in my presence, oh my God, this pain I'm feeling is so awful, I don't think I can bear it. I was talking to a pastor about this project last week, and he said this, and I'll leave you with this thought. He said, there is a person in my church who came up to me after the service, and they said that worship song that we were singing, when we get to the phrase, oh my God, I stop singing because it would be sacrilege if I sang it in the middle of the worship song. To me, and he said to me, what should I do with that? I think he needs to meet Gordon because at least I would suggest perhaps what I'm discovering is that there's an opportunity here to reclaim at least a part of that phrase, and what would happen in our world if we did? Vocative. Vocative. We would drop the H. Drop the H. Stick with the O. Uh-huh. So, thank you for listening and for engaging with us. If you found this conversation even mildly amusing or intriguing, then my hunch is that maybe my framework could be onto something. Good theology coupled with good theory leads you to a particular kind of content that may be life-giving. Now, Gordon, I have something to give you as we close because I want to thank you for being here. And um, the only thing, there was only one thing I thought of that would be appropriate to give you after this conversation. So I called somebody I don't know very well. His name is Chris Emery. He made his fame on Dragon's Den, CBC, because he's the co-owner of the company that makes these, OMG Candy. And I thought, well, if we're going to be talking about, oh my God, this has got to be the most appropriate thing I could give you to thank you. And I, I actually talked to him yesterday, and uh, he was delighted to hear that uh, he actually, this came from his factory today, and uh, I'm really happy to, uh, to give you that. And You'll notice that, you know, if you're now conflicted, you know, can I eat the chocolate, can I not, is that going to be sacrilege? You'll notice that the O is a vocative O in there. <laughs> There's no H in there. That is a third commandment approved piece of chocolate that you're going to eat. And Chris Emery was kind enough to not only give me a package for you, but at a seriously discounted price, he gave me enough for all of you. So we're going to have the uh, folks come and hand these out. These bags are going to come down the aisles, and in good Open it up. communication, the good kind of communication theory, we're going to do a communal thing, break open the bag, and share the chocolate with the people in your pew. And uh, note, they are not individually wrapped. It's when you put your hand in there, you get chocolate on your fingers. There are nuts in here, so if you have an allergy, please don't eat them. Just look at them. So. And God, God made chocolate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>